political party symbols can be used for government aid. Petronas Gas net profit surges declares 16 cent dividend. Good evening and Salam Malaysia Madani. You are watching Malaysia Tonight with me, Renee Fong. Any form of government aid given during the by-election campaign for the Pulai parliamentary seat and the Simpang Juram state seat cannot have the symbol of any political parties. Prime Minister Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim, who is also Pakatan Harapan PH Chairman, said the matter had been discussed with Johor Menteri Besar Datuk On Hafiz Ghazi. He stressed that symbols of political parties cannot be used because all government aid is from the government. Ini telah diamalkan oleh Perikatan Nasional dulu dan saya percaya ada juga satu dua yang berlaku dalam keadaan perpaduan dan arahan kita ini tidak boleh. Bantuan kerajaan boleh disalur atas nama kerajaan. He was met after attending the Kenduri Rakyat and handing over of 1,000 Rahmah baskets at Dataran Taman Dahlia, Johor Bahru today. The Election Commission has set tomorrow as nomination day for the two by-elections, while early voting is on 5th September and 9th September is polling day. The by-elections were called following the death of their incumbents, Domestic Trade and Cost of Living Minister Datuk Sri Salahuddin Ayub, last 23rd July. Datuk Sri Salahuddin was the Pulai Member of Parliament as well as the Simpang Juram Assemblyman. On another note, the Prime Minister said that the government, in not wanting the people to be burdened with the increasing cost of living, would ensure everything that is within its control continues to be carried out, including the provision of subsidies for essential goods. This also included expanding and continuing the Jualan Rahmah Initiative, which is the legacy of the late Dato Sri Salahuddin Ayub, which proved to be able to help the less affordable as they can get essential items at a lower price. However, he said there are things that are beyond the government's control. As such, he said, for the long term, the government is focusing on strengthening the agricultural sector to reduce the country's dependence on food imports, which reach tens of billions of ringgit every year. The Health Ministry, MOH, today confirmed that there are two positive cases of monkeypox recorded in the country. Health Director General Datuk Dr. Muhammad Razi Abu Hassan said a confirmed case on 26 July involved a foreign man, while the second case was a local man who was a contact of the first monkeypox case and was confirmed positive on 29th July. The first case involves a foreign man who has been living and working in Malaysia since April 2022. He has a history of travelling to a country with reported cases of monkeypox on 6 July this year and returned to Malaysia on 10th July. He started showing symptoms on July 19th. Blisters started appearing on 23rd July and he was isolated and was released on 10th August after making a full recovery without complications. The second case, a local man experienced symptoms while in quarantine because he was in contact with the index case and had been ordered to undergo quarantine since 27th July and was confirmed positive on 29th July. He is still in isolation and is in good health. All contacts of the first case have been identified and their health status monitored. Malaysia has yet to decide whether to impose restrictions on seafood imports from Japan following the release of treated radioactive water from the Fukushima nuclear plant into the Pacific Ocean. 
Agriculture and Food Security Minister Datuk Sri Muhammad Sabu said the health ministry and environmental experts were conducting a study to determine any potential danger before the government decides on the matter. Pihak Jepun mengatakan ianya telah denaturalize. Walau bagaimanapun kita akan pihak kita akan membuat kajian dan akan mengambil penilaian yang bersama dengan negara-negara lain kerana soal uh, sisa nuklear yang dimasuk ke dalam laut ini dia boleh merebak ke seluruh dunia dan kita akan buat keputusan bersama it was reported that several countries such as China and Hong Kong decided to suspend seafood imports from Japan as Tokyo began discharging treated radioactive water into the sea yesterday. Nato Sri Muhammad Sabu said the government is now focusing on the security of food supply, especially rice, in response to early warnings from countries like India and Vietnam that may increase prices or stop exporting altogether. Meanwhile, Tokyo Electric Power Company, or TEPCO, said seawater samples taken following the release of wastewater from the crippled Fukushima nuclear reactor showed radioactivity levels well within safe limits. TEPCO took what it called rapid tests on Thursday afternoon after the release into the Pacific Ocean began, and today it said that the results showed that radioactivity levels were within safe limits. The operator says that the water from from cooling the remains of three reactors has been filtered of all radioactive elements except for tritium and is safe. This is backed by the International Atomic Energy Agency, which said that samples taken from the first batch of diluted water prepared for discharge showed that tritium levels were well within safe limits. Construction of the East Coast Rail Link ECRL project has achieved 48.77% progress. Malaysia Rail Link Seren Berhad MRL Chairman Tan Sri Muhammad Zuki Ali said the work progress was in line with the development of the project from Kota Baru in Kelantan to the Gomba Integrated Terminal, which is scheduled for completion in December 2026 to enable the ECRL service to operate in January. 2027. Speaking at the ECRL's tunnel breakthrough at Kampung Gedong Siam 3 today, Tan Sri Muhammad Zuki said the encouraging rate of progress for this project is not only focused on infrastructure works and the construction of the mega project, but also the involvement of local companies in the implementation of ECRL. This project involves the participation of about 2,700 local companies consisting of contractors, consultants and suppliers from 2017 to the first quarter of this year. The contract value involving the local companies in the ECRL project work has reached about 12 billion ringgit, surpassing the target of 10 0.8 billion ringgit for civil works in the project. On the tunnel construction in Kampung Gudung Siam 3, stretching 1.32 kilometers and scheduled for completion in April next year, he said the work progress went according to schedule. Malaysia Airports Holdings Berhad MHB registered more than 11 million total passenger movements for July 2023 in an ongoing upward trend of steady traffic growth. Both Malaysia and Turkey operations recording a new high of 7.4 million and 3.7 million passenger movements respectively. In a statement released today, MAHB said international and domestic passenger movements were also recorded at the highest volume for the year to date, with 5.4 million international passengers and 5.7 million domestic passengers. These represent 89 and 87 percent respectively of passenger numbers over the same period in 2019, signalling consistent progress towards a full recovery of pre-pandemic volumes. International passenger movements in Malaysia for July 2023 increased by almost 10% to 3.5 million passengers from 3.2 million passengers in the preceding month, while domestic passenger movements totaled 3.9 million up to 
0.0% from 3.8 million passengers in June 2023. The growth from both the international and domestic sectors were contributed by the local school holiday towards the tail end of July. Some holidays in the Northern Hemisphere, gradual return of China travellers, the return of Hajj pilgrims, the operation of new airlines and additional flight frequencies. Petronas Gas Berhat's Pet Gas net profit for the second quarter and 30th of June 2023 surged to 485.37 million ringgit from 396.50 million ringgit in the same period a year earlier. The company said in a filing with Bursa Malaysia today that revenue for the quarter also improved to 1.64 billion ringgit driven by higher revenue from the utility segment on the back of higher product prices. The jump in profit was attributed to higher gross profit coupled with a bigger share of profit from joint venture companies and more interest income from fund investments. Low exposure to foreign exchange from the early settlement of US dollar lease liabilities for floating storage units at its liquefied natural gas LNG regasification terminal in Sungai Udang, Malacca, further boosted the company's earnings. A lower tax expense also contributed to the higher profit, the company said, adding that the corresponding quarter's tax expense was higher due to the imposition of a prosperity tax for the year of assessment 2022. Pet Gas also posted higher earnings per share of 24.53 cent against 20.04 cent previously. It approved the second interim dividend of 16 cent per ordinary share amounting to 316.6 million ringgit for the financial year ending 31st December 2023 to be paid on 22nd September 2023 to depositors registered in the records of depositors at the close of business on 12 September 2023. In sports, Bonnie breaks world record again at Dubai World Paralifting Championships. National powerlifting ace and world record holder Bonnie Bunya Augustin produced another sensational performance to erase his own world powerlifting record in the men's up to 72 kilogram category at the World Para Powerlifting Championships in Dubai yesterday. Bonnie, who started with a massive 210 kilogram first attempt, which was almost thrice his body weight, added 10 kilos more in the next round before hitting the new world record mark of 231 kilograms. Donato Telesca from Italy, who cleared 202 kilograms, was a distant second to the home the silver. While Uzbekistan powerlifter Bagzod Jamilov claimed the bronze with a lift of 200 kilograms. The record was the second for the Sarawakian Bonnie as he had lifted 230 kg at the 2021 World Para Powerlifting Championships in Dubai. After two days of elite competitions, China are on top with four medals that included three gold and one silver followed by Great Britain, Vietnam and Malaysia with one gold each. Moving to Saudi Pro League, French striker Karim Benzema scored his first Saudi Pro League goal to help new club Al Ittihad to a 4-0 win over Al Riyad. Benzema, who wore the captain's armband, netted his goal on a give and go with Romarinho in the 17th minute to put Itihad up 1 0 and then added an assist on Saleh Al Amri's late second half strike to reach the final 4 0 margin. Midfielder Abderaza Hamdallah provided the rest of the scoring with a penalty kick in the 25th minute for a 2 0 lead, then a highlight reel worthy tally on a bicycle kick in first half injury time that gave the visitors a 3-0 lead. 
Meanwhile, recent transfer Frank Kessie netted a late game winning goal to lift his new club Al Ali to a 1 0 win over Al Okud. Ivorian Kessie, who spent time with both Barcelona and AC Milan before transferring to the SPL this summer, fired home six minutes into second half injury time after receiving a perfectly placed pass from Roberto Firmino. The win gave unbeaten Al Ali nine points in the young season and allowed them to remain with undefeated Al Ittihad at the top of the SPL standings. And now we move on to the next segment of our bulletin on the table. Over to you, Otto. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Renee. You're living well. You're looking very well today. And it's been some time since we have uh, done this together. Yeah, <laughs> right. Well, Salam Malaysia Madani, and uh, I'm Otto Othman. All right, and I'm Otto Othman. And uh, welcome to the program tonight. I'm with uh, Captain Abdul Wahab Ibrahim. Now, Captain Wahab has had an experienced pilot having an extensive resume flying for both local and international airlines throughout his career. And uh, he was a panel member with the MH370 investigation team and is currently a flight instructor at a flight training center in Singapore and has what, 43 years of experience as well. Well, that's a long time. Right. Well, thank you very much, Captain, uh, for being into the show and uh, taking the time off uh, your busy schedule to be with us today. Now, without yeah. further ado, we'd like to ask you this simple question. Uh, we'd like to delve into the recent uh, air crash uh, near Elmina Township. Now, no new leads on the investigations as uh, the new only solid lead, right, the cockpit voice recorder, or a CVR, uh, was sent to the Florida for further analysis. Now, I understand that's where the manufacturer is from. Now, we want to know from your experience, the whole, what does the role does uh, for the CVR play in any air crash uh, investigation? Okay, first, uh, I would like to qualify uh, that uh, whatever we discussed today, it's still from the same source. I am getting information from videos, from everything, so I am not privy to any official information from the authority. So based on all that, yeah, uh, now that you're asking me CVR, what CVR does is that it's supposed to record all the conversation uh, in the cockpit between the two pilots, either an open conversation or even com conversation through the radio or through the intercom and conversation between the pilot and the ground. Uh, the environment uh, noise, probably like a cabin crew come and ask, uh, can I offer you a cup of coffee? Even all those are recorded. And importantly, the, the, the sound uh, level in the cockpit where uh, if there is like engine problem or some explosion somewhere, it could be heard from the car. All those are being recorded. So it is, uh, Pretty important for for uh, accident investigation, especially when there is a problem that 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 aggravate from a small problem become a big one, and the at the end of it, the loss of the aeroplane. So we know, oh, this is where the start of the problem, and it became like this and like this until it probably uh, end up with a disaster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what it is for. Now. Then there's the uh, flight data recorder of which, uh, unfortunately, this light jet did not have. But isn't it a protocol to have like both CVR and FDR on board? Uh, okay, before I answer that, well, let me continue with the earlier one. Uh, bear in mind that they will record the last 30 minutes of the conversation at the cockpit. In fact, for the later aeroplane, there is a later requirement that it has to increase to 120 minutes, uh, mm -hmm. uh, what is being recorded in the cockpit. And it is self-erased, yeah? So it will retain the last 30 minutes or 120 minutes, which we have is applicable. Your other question just now was about? The FDR. Uh, about the FDR, okay. Interestingly, I was also equally surprised that they didn't have one. Uh, on further research, I found out that uh, a November registered aeroplane, I mean, uh, which means the American registered aircraft, there are some condition which 
uh, I think it's something to do with number of passengers that are lesser. The aircraft need not have uh, FDR, but certainly must have a CVR. So you're saying there are certain designs of an aircraft that require certain protocols and certain uh, equipments on board a certain flight? Yes, correct. Actually. Had it been a Malaysian registered aeroplane, they must have their equipment there. And of course, the issue here is cost. Perhaps an instrument like that or a gadget like that in the aircraft will cost a few hundred thousand US dollars. So there's a big saving for someone who are keen to buy the aeroplane. Mm -hmm. yep. Now, in, in terms of expertise, um, we're seeing a wealth of uh, expertise involved in uh, this investigation, even thoughts uh, mainly on a domestic matter, even though it's a domestic matter, but there are also certain uh, people who are involved in this. Now, we want to know, uh, could you explain to our, our people, our audience, uh, who are the stakeholders involved uh, when conducting this investigation? Okay, stakeholders initially when an, when, when an accident happened, it's of course the police. Uh, you, uh, uh, when somebody see that or the ATC or found out that there's a missing aeroplane and there are time limit that, let's say the missing is somewhere else, nobody saw. So within like 30 minutes, they have to trigger such search and rescue, right? Uh, in this case, somebody see it. So immediately the police will have to be there to give assistance as and when required. Why the police is that they will have control of it first because uh, in case there is element of crime that is involved in this uh, 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 this accident, if it is found to be clear of all that, so the next person or the next authority to come in will be the BSKU, which will have full control to investigate the cause of the accident. I see. Right. Now, any thoughts on how long this investigation, uh, investigation will take? And uh, since the flight industry experts said that it could take up to a week if the plane's uh, black box is not damaged. However, that is not in this case. So how is that? I think my guess is as good as yours. Uh, I don't think because there's a lot of assumptions and theory got to be uh, that, that, that has to be assumed. Right, and then the, and without backup, as as you probably aware, the flight data recorder would have revealed everything that happened in the aircraft, because they recorded or normally record all kinds of aircraft engine and system parameters in the black box. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in this case we don't have, and we also now having big question whether the CVR can or whether anything that we can be deciphered from the CVR, which is still a question now. That's why it's being sending, I understand, to the manufacturer. Now, generally speaking, uh, flying is still the safest way to travel or uh, there might be a certain parties that dispute this. However, uh, despite all protocols taken, you know, pre-flight checks, etc., Air accidents still occur, and at times it's uh, kind of a lucky situation as well. So your experience being a commercial pilot on a personal note, are there additional precautions uh, that you take before taking off or you know, being a flight instructor, advise your trainees um, on these extra precautions? Do you have that? In fact, I think precaution is none. But going back to accidents that has happened before, you find that training nowadays emphasize a lot, a lot on, on teamwork, on human factor, mm -hmm. you see? And, and uh, because that seems to be the, the, the causes of accident, Ma majority of the accident causes by human factor. So uh, with that improvement being emphasized a lot in training nowadays, I think we are putting it at, at, at one level higher than it used to be. Mm -hmm. In terms of technical, I think they have improved so much. It's so redundant, uh, it hardly fail, as I probably, our conversation just now, I told oh, yeah. you. Yeah, we, 30, we had a very interesting yeah, conversation, for, yes. 43 <laughs> years, I hardly have any, any uh, emergency or problem with aeroplane. It's so reliable, yeah, I'm so thankful. Uh, and and uh, since we're talking about safety as well and protocols, and uh, since you did mention about uh, the human factor where it does sometimes make mistakes as well, mm -hmm. And we're seeing a lot of uh, uh, commercial flights, or would you say uh, uh, cargo flights, mm -hmm. being uh, piloted by non-piloted uh, individuals. Uh, what's your take on that? 
uh, cargo flight. Uh, can you say that again? Oh, uh, their pilots are not piloting the cargo flight, so it's more towards like uh, AI driven or oh, you mean physical pilots in the, in the future? The cockpit. Yeah, in, in the, the future. future. I have my my. Uh, I'm kind of skeptical. I have my reservation there. I give you a clear example. The present aircraft can fly on its own with only one pilot selecting what needs to be selected. Why do we carry two pilots? Mm -hmm. So for the same reason, I think at the end of the day, we need a manual backup, somebody there to take care or to save the aeroplane if something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. so, so I still feel that if you ask me to go and fly, let's say in the future, there will be pilotless aircraft. I yes. don't think I would like to be there on the aircraft. Really? <laughs> yeah. Or it could be like a culture, cultural issue as yeah, well. Probably. Yeah, probably. I'm from the old schools of thought, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Thank you very much. Now, mm -hmm. uh, your experience uh, being on the MH370 team. Now, yeah, yeah. I take it that uh, was a near impossible feat to come up with um, any, let's say, for example, any uh, solid findings, let alone trying to bring to a close closure, bring to closure. So, your experience on that. Okay, I have only one answer. Until we find the wreckage, hopefully we can find a black box. And uh, I was told that uh, the data, if it is uh, not, or, or I would say the, the box itself is fireproof, uh, waterproof, and shockproof, and all that, is probably still intact. Perhaps we can still find retrieve data from there, which will answer a lot of questions that I have and probably the public also have. What exactly happened to the aeroplane? It's a very yeah. big question over there. Yes, yes. Yeah. Right. So, uh, thank you very much, Captain. Um, any it's a pleasure. When it comes to this, right, uh, it's a very interesting topic, but uh, unfortunately, we do not have any time. Mm. Uh, but is there anything else that you'd like to add? I can tell the rest of the uh, audience and public that flying is still the safest means of transportation. That much I can assure. Because the regulatory bodies, the regulation, uh, uh, they monitor and they make sure everything is in order. Before. And the airline itself, the operator itself. So uh, nothing can be safer than follow what is supposed to be doing. Yeah. Well, thank you very much to our guest today. That concludes this edition of Malaysia Tonight. And along with me, Rene Fong, I'm Otto Othman, Malaysia Madani, Teka Perpaduan, Penuhi Harapan. Thank you for watching. Thank you.